around the world, the Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. David Langford here again today, and we just trust and we pray that the Lord has touched your heart and life in a very special way already. And we're just here to share the Word of God. If you saw last week's program, you sensed the anointing and the Holy Spirit of God as He came into the studio and made a drastic appeal for the lost. The only thing I'm interested in is winning souls to Jesus. I thank those of you who have watched this ministry for any length of time knows that my heart is to preach repentance, turn America back to God, and for sinners to come to the saving grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. When God calls any man, he already knows how he's wired that man. He knows how that man will operate. There's nothing about the man that God does not know. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, I am what I am by the grace of God. I too am what I am by the grace of God. And the way I minister, the way that I preach and proclaim the word of God, he wired me that way. I don't try to emulate anyone else. I don't try to copy anyone. I dig in the script, I dig in the scriptures and dig out messages to bring to the people of God. I don't sermonize. I don't buy books about sermons. I talk to God. When you talk to God, he'll give you the best messages that can be given to a man because it is the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. It is the inspiration of the Holy Ghost that ministers to people. And when God inspires a man to put together a message, a sermon, because it is inspired by the Holy Ghost, it will have results because it is touched, it is ordained of God. Amen. And again, please share the telecast with everyone that you can. That's one of the greatest ways to bless the voice of evangelism by sharing this ministry. Send them to our website if they can't get the telecast. Send them to our website, www.thevoiceofevangelism.com, and we post these TV programs on our website. So you can watch them there. And I know they'll be a blessing to you because we do preach His Word without compromise. Our subject is, has America become a harlot nation? Has America become a harlot nation? I want to go today to Jeremiah chapter 2. We're going to pick up in verse 19. Jeremiah 2 and 19. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backslidings shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee saith the Lord God of hosts. The pain, the suffering, the difficulties that Israel would now suffer was because of their stubbornness and their unwillingness to repent. It is sad when God Almighty says to a people, thine own wickedness shall correct thee. Exactly what does that mean? When Babylon, the Chaldeans, Nebuchadnezzar, came into Israel, Jerusalem, and began to eviscerate the entirety of that nation, they realized then what their wickedness had brought upon them. But the tragedy is, it was too late. He said in verse 17, I believe it was, 
You have procured these things. You have you've brought these judgments on your own self because you are stubborn. You are rebellious. You are hard-hearted. You are calloused. You have forsaken me. You have abandoned me. And this, Jehovah says, is the end results. 1 Samuel 15, 23 says, Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So many in America today that claim to be Christians are stubborn, full of witchcraft. They will not submit. They will not surrender. They will not yield their lives wholly to the Lord. I've never seen such faulty worship that I'm seeing today. I've never seen such faulty doctrine that I'm seeing today. I read some time ago where a man, purportedly a Protestant preacher, said, we need to forgive God for the things he has done. And I thought, how crazy, how insane is a man that claims to be a God-called preacher say that we need to forgive God? What has God ever done that's wrong? God is the personification. He is the embodiment of righteousness. He cannot do wrong because he is God. You see, this is humanism. That man, that so-called preacher that made that statement is so full of, full of humanism. He's trying to rationalize an infinite God with a pea brain. That, that man is lucky if he even has a brain to make a statement of that nature. That, that's the problem in the church world today. Men that are up in the pulpits leading people and say things like, we got to forgive God for what he's done. Or to make statements that homosexuals have more faith than the blood-bought redeemed have? This is crazy. And to think these men deem themselves qualified to minister to people? This is unbelievable what's taking place in America. God says through Jeremiah, thine own wickedness shall correct thee. And thy backslidings shall reprove thee. We are a backslidden nation. It is hard to find righteousness. It is hard to find purity. It is hard to find wholesomeness. Nearly everything, nearly everything in America has become full of perversity. So much has been corrupted, and the things they are teaching our children, I pray every parent listening to this, or grandparent, if you could get your children out of the public fool system, because it's not a school system, it is an indoctrination, it is full of fallacy and heresy, and there's no true fundamentals there to teach right. Get them out. Try to get them into a Christian school. You say, that's going to cost me. Everything that has value will always cost you. It was Jimmy Carter that gave us the Department of Education. And ever since then, America has been going down educationally when it comes to our young people and our children. They are feeding our children nothing but garbage. Garbage. We're letting the world raise our children. Parents, that is your responsibility. That is your job. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child. And the way he should go when he's old, he will not depart from it. While you have your children, you are a mere steward of their lives. You have them for a parenthetical time. So while you have them, you pour all of the good stuff you can pour into their lives so that when they get old, 
if they do backslide or they do become wayward because of what you've put into them, they'll come back to it. That's what the scripture says. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. You know, I, I, I appreciate uh, parents who are godly parents and try to nurture and, and steer their children in paths of righteousness. The old cliche is true. As the twig is bent, so grows the tree. Many times they'll plant a tree and put a rope around it and pull it this way and drive a rod in the ground and tie it to that rod. Why? They're trying to steer that tree and how it's going to grow. Sometimes you have to put pressure you have to put pressure on your children while they're young to develop them in the right way. And ma'am, you cannot become a girlfriend to your daughter when she's 14 or 15 years old. You must remain her mother and teach her godly principles. I've seen it through the years as a pastor. Mothers want to be friends with their daughters. And by the time they get to be 16 or 17, they are so indifferent to wholesomeness. Why? Because it was not put in them. It was not poured into them. And fathers, it's the same for you. Be a godly dad. Bear the fruit of the word of God and the spirit of God. Teach your children. This was one of the great tenets in Israel's history. You read from Exodus all the way through. He said, you speak of the miracles. You speak of the great things I have done. You tell your children all of the goodness that I have been to Israel, what I've done for them, how I led them through the wilderness, how I housed them and I closed them and I nurtured them. You speak of the goodness of God, how I parted the Red Sea. They were to forever rehearse the goodness of God. If you don't believe that, read the eighth chapter of the book of Acts at the message Stephen preached to the Jewish leaders, he talked about how God, through Abraham, brought them into existence, led them and kept them and gave them a promised land. Hundreds of years later, Stephen was preaching on the blessings of God to the nation of Israel. America, where are the godly, where are the godly men that will preach without compromise, who will not pollute, who will not preach because they are afraid somebody might get offended. Where are the men that will stand and cry aloud and spare not? You see, we, we spare people. We, we preach from a disposition of fear and favor. Well, I fear this person. If I preach this way, I might lose their finances. Or we preach this way to procure favor from a person in the church. Whatever the case might be. That's not how we preach. We preach under the leadership and the anointing of the Holy Ghost of God. And we preach this book. We preach the word of God and we preach it without compromise. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. God's word is never going to pass away. God's word was in the beginning. The dateless past, God's word already was. Before God ever inspired Moses to, 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 to write the Pentateuch, the book of Genesis and onward, that word was already settled in heaven. Psalms 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. When was the beginning? Well, you and I can't answer that because God has always been. Thus he said, I am that I am. He always has been. And his word already was the word of God was not an afterthought after creation and God said well I I've got to add these things etc 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 no 
The word already was. He just then inspired men to write the Holy Scriptures. But they were already in the volumes of God's book in heaven. 2 Peter 1.21 says, For the prophecy came in the old time, not by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is why we believe in the inerrancy of God's Word. I believe this book is absolutely true. And on the outside cover, I believe it's true where it says Holy Bible. I believe the Word of God is holy. The Word of God is none other than Jesus Christ. That's why He's always been the dateless past. God has always been. The Word of God is nothing new. We may, in our humanistic thoughts, perceive, interpret it that way. But the Word of God is as old as God. Because that's what he said. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God has always been and always will be. Israel, because they had forsaken God, because they were backslidden, because they were filled with sin and evilness in their lives, he said, thine own wickedness shall correct thee and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter. Israel brought evil and bitterness in their own lives. They were reaping what they had sown. America has reaped some heinous and terrible things in the past. We, 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 we've sown some immeasurable corruption. And we will reap that which we have sown. I know people don't believe that, but it is a reality. So he said, your, your backslidings, they're going to reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter. And why did this happen? Thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee. God is wholesome. God is pure. God is clean. God is just. And so many people abuse God because they don't have a fear of God. I fear God. I don't fear him in the sense that I think he might come down out of heaven with a two by four or a baseball bat and tenderize my head, though he probably should do it sometimes because of my hard headedness. But that's not the kind of God that we serve. And that's not the kind of fear that I have. The fear that I have is that he's mighty, almighty. And that he's one to be feared. He's one to be respected. He's one to be esteemed. He's one to be highly regarded. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 4 verse 8, the cherubim, the seraphim, they rest not day or night crying, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Can you imagine that? In the hearing of God 24-7. These, these cherubim, they don't stop to take a lunch break. They don't go and eat. They don't take vacation. They don't go take a nap. They rest not day or night crying, holy, holy, holy. Holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. The God that I serve is a holy God. He's triple holy. His holiness is magnified beyond anyone's human comprehension. Why? He's a holy God. I know what it means to have been in the presence of God to the degree I felt like God was sucking the life out of my body. I felt like I was dying only because I was in the presence of God. It's as though his, his energy, his power, his presence was taking the life out of me. And I remember lying flat on my back and I said, God, stop. If you don't stop, you're going to kill me. 
I'd never been in that dimension, in the presence of God. I was in the holy of holies. I was in that glorious sphere, that glorious realm. I hear people today, and it's somewhat comical to me. Send down your glory. Send down your glory. Send down your glory. Friends, the glory of God will consume you and kill you. The glory of God is nothing to be toyed with. I'm not talking about the anointing. I'm talking about the glory of God, the very presence of God. Moses says, show me thy glory. He said, I can't. No man can see me and live. And he hid him in the cleft of the rock. The rock typified Jesus Christ. And he said, I'm going to pass by you and you'll get a small glimpse of my hinder part. Now, the Greek Theological term is anthropomorphism, giving God human characteristics like the hand of the Lord upon the righteous, the eyes of the Lord, his ears open to their cries. Those are what we call anthropomorphisms, giving God human characteristics like you and I have, a hand, an eye, a nose, an ear, etc. Jesus has that, but God, Paul said, and, and John said, no man's ever seen God. Don't want to get into that, but God is so vast, so, so huge. It's more than the mind can comprehend. Israel had lost that. These were the people that God had brought through the Red Sea. These were the people that God rained down manna from heaven. These were the people that God sent the quail and gave them so much flesh. They wanted flesh, God gave them flesh. Until the quail flesh ran out their nostrils. Sounds a little bit grotesque. But God gave them that much flesh. He's the God that caused water to come out of the rock. And just give them a gully washer of water. He's the God that for 40 years... Their sandals did not wear out. Can you imagine wearing the same pair of shoes every day for 40 years? 40 years. And those sandals never wore out. That was the goodness of God, even to a faithless people. This is why I mentioned previously about rehearsing. Rehearsing the goodness, the blessings of God. Rehearsing those Tell your children, I pray you have Holy Ghost encounters. I pray you've had Holy Ghost experiences that you can share with your family. Personally, don't get mad, don't get upset with me. That's what's missing in the modern church today. The manifestation of the Holy Ghost of God. Where, where, where there is a difference in your sanctuary. There is an all there is a presence, there is a magnificence that overwhelms everyone's heart and life. It is the presence of God. We need that in the church today. I get so many letters and so many emails of starving, emaciated Christians who say, I wish I could find me a great Holy Ghost Spirit-filled church. I know we're not supposed to live in the past but as I was doing a, a renewal of wedding vows, a couple 25-year anniversary, I was talking to one of the attendees, and he said to me, he said, you know, God hasn't changed. We've changed. And I said, that's exactly right. God is immutable. Immutable, meaning he cannot and he does not change at all. What's happened? We have changed. Well, when I was a little boy growing up, people ran, shouted, danced under the power of the Holy Ghost of God. There were messages in tongues, interpretation, the gift of prophecy. Sinners would walk down an aisle with tears streaming down their faces, so convicted of God. Why? Because of the presence of God in their church. We need to get that back in the church today. And there will be those who won't like that, friend. There'll be those who'll complain about the presence of God. There are those who'll be critical 
about a manifestation, a glorious manifestation of God's presence in your midst. But don't worry about those people. You get your cup full. You get filled up with the Holy Ghost of God. You get your eyes off of people. You get your eyes on Jesus Christ. And when you come to the house of God, you bring him with you. And you worship him in spirit and in truth. For he seeketh such to worship him in that way. We've turned to entertainment rather than a move of God. We've turned to pacification. We, we, we pacify people. Listen, when God shows up, he knows how to touch everyone in the right way. He knows every heart. He knows every need. He knows where every person is in their life. He knows where they are. He knows exactly how to touch them. When they walk through the doors, he knows how to touch a song. He can anoint a song so powerfully that it touches the hearts and lives of people where they don't even wait for the preacher to preach. They come on to the altar anyway, and they want God's blessings. They want God's touch. Friend, if we'll pray and cry out to God, God will do it again. Remember, he doesn't change. If he's done it in times past, he'll do it again. When I was a little boy, we had prayer meetings, just like the early church. People came together and they prayed, and the Holy Ghost would fall. That's Acts chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word of God with boldness. That's what I want. That's what I'm going to seek God for. Because God can do it again. He is God. The Bible says the latter glory is going to be greater than the former glory. I believe he's going to save the best till the last. And that's why I'm glad I'm alive at this time. I believe we're going to see two moves of God. One that will glorify and edify the church. And the other that will reprove and rebuke a sinful world. God is going to move one way or another. God bless you. We love you. We thank you for your prayers and your support. And again, please share the telecast with your friends. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.